thanks for that Ashling, and I know I'll be looking forward to tasting some of that brown bread later from the winning finalist. We're back now at the Agriland Live Pavilion here at the Ploughing Championships in Rathaniska and we're continuing our theme today of farmer well-being, health and safety, farm families and rural life. And I'm joined for our live discussion now by Alice Doyle, the IFA family family, Farm Family Chair and Dr Michael Hayden from the University uh, of Maynooth, uh, the School of Business there. Thank you both for joining us today. Alice, I might go to you first. A few months ago, you and I spoke and we sat down and you were explaining at the time about what farm families are currently facing in this country. That was a couple of months ago. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't too far down the road of the Ukraine-Russia conflict at that mm. point. We were coming out of COVID. Beef prices at the time weren't the worst, but you at the time mooted, we can't know what the back end of the year will bring yet. Over the last few months, a lot of things have changed. How are farm families now experiencing the current crisis? Crisis, I suppose, energy, cost of living, inflation. Huge change since we were talking. It's unbelievable that so much change could take place in less than six months. And unfortunately, a lot of it hasn't been for the better, but there has been some good things too. So we must talk about those as well, because we can't talk ourselves into the ground either. Look, from the negative side, we'll start with the negative and work to the positive. From the negative side of things, look, the input put prices on farms has rocketed. It was starting when we spoke before, but it really has rocketed now, you know, with fertiliser prices at an all time high. Uh, and also we have the problem that the, even the, the possibility, will it be even available in particularly in the spring? We know we're working on probably a lot of uh, stocks that are there from last year that were created before the gas shortage in Europe but now we wonder will the stocks be coming possibly maybe next spring but definitely the year after and we have to think that far out in farming. Uh, we have the, the the whole area of the energy prices inside the farm door and outside the farm door. Out in the yard we have the energy prices you know anyone that's milking has huge uh, energy costs there and then if you come inside, the, the, and, any, and no matter what enterprise you're in, you have huge energy costs out in the yard. But you come inside the door and then the farm family there, the, you know, we sometimes forget the farm family is inside the door as well. Huge costs there because you have heating, you have electricity, uh, you have oil, you have fuel. All of that has, has gone. The cost of living in the supermarket, and I say myself as a, a, a wife going into a, the shop to buy my grocery bill has increased dramatically in the last six months and a lot of the things that are even that I might want I'll get them eventually but they mightn't be as readily available as they were so I think the, the farm family is caught from inside and outside so you know the energy and the fuel prices contractors you know we see that now for example when you go to when we're going to do silage there back in, Ju in May June time everything the cost of baling silage has gone up dramatically because the the, the contractor has to cover his costs we cut corn uh, in uh, august again the contractor was coming in to use it. combines using an awful lot more and the tractors to draw and the traders to draw the 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 corn to the supplier so it's 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 catching us on all sides unfortunately the only good thing and i would like to add that there are good sides that you know the it has been pretty good here from the side, from the point of view of prices to a point. We can't, they're not they're never secure, but they we had reasonably good harvest. The weather was good. The return the return was reasonably good, but the inputs costs offset that. You we had the beef prices held, uh, but again the input costs offset that. The milk prices held, but then in a lot of cases we had a drought in pretty in the southeast where I come from. There was drought, and that affected so farmers had to use into the next uh, next winter's silage um, provision. So we have that problem. So y you have the good and the bad. Fortunately, because it was a good year, people are managing. But I would be very concerned that if you know things keep going the way they're going, or if any there's any fallback in the markets we have big, big problems ahead. Dr. Michael Hayden, I might take up what Alice was saying there about some of the challenges that are facing farm families at the moment. We don't know what the future holds. In terms of the business of farming, for young people trying to get into the business, how can they see it as a viable future long-term source of income when things are so uncertain and precarious at the moment? Yes, well, as Alice said, there are huge challenges. The input costs of fuel, feed and fertiliser are all going up the whole time. But market prices have been quite good, so average farm income has gone up quite a bit. 
recently, but it depends on the sector then really. So dairy is doing really well, tillage is kind of in the middle, and but beef is lagging behind. So depending on the sector, there's huge challenges, but yet opportunities in some sectors. And I suppose you mentioned there that dairy is doing quite well and commodities are good and there's a d global demand there for dairy products, uh, particularly from Ireland where, where we have a very good uh, dairy export sector. But what about the people who want to get in to continue beef farming, Alice the beef farmer themselves, but they also you know, have other operations going on as well to supplement that, no doubt, Alice. What about the, the beef farmers, the sheep farmers who you know, want to maybe take over from parents and they are finding it difficult because they'll have to get off farm work as well. How do, how do they make it a economical, you know, sustainable future for themselves? Well, a lot of, say, of the beef and sheep are part-time farmers, really, and they do have off farm income. But one of the big challenges is the ageing farming population in those sectors especially. And some of that is kind of made up because farmers in that situation need to farm into retirement because they, they are not availing of the state pension. They may have not have the necessary pension contributions built up and that could be because they didn't take over the farm themselves until quite late in life or for some reason they just haven't made the contributions. Their income level may not have required the contributions to be made. So ageing farming population causes fa problems with farm succession and transferring the family farm so it's kind of mechanisms at both ends need to be looked at to entice in new ed entrants but also facilitate retirement in older age. Are there mechanisms that could be implemented in the short term to, I suppose, bridge that gap for farmers who want to retire or the pension, you know? Yeah. I suppose there's no short term bullet solution because as we know there's a culture in Ireland also that farmers do want to keep farming and they're maybe sometimes adverse to retirement. But if there are structures put in place and over a longer period, I think the circumstances will make it easier for farmers to retire. One would be the pension situation. For example, maybe there could be a flat rate pension, PRSI contribution that farmers must make regardless of their income. And then for farmers' wives, a lot of for the last number of years or decades even, farmers' wives were never really included in the pension contribution, the PRSI contribution for pensions and they found themselves at retirement age having no pension. So I think sons and daughters working on the farm or other family members, they all need to be looked at in how they can also make contributions to have a pension at retirement. Yeah, Alice, of course, you know, it isn't just a farmer and, you know, the farmer is experiencing the input costs, as you said, out in the yard, but there's a whole family there oftentimes, you know, there's a, a farming wife or husband and sometimes they might be working offsite, they might be school teachers or whatever, might, might be working in the local town or village. Um, there's kids there getting older, trying to get part time jobs here, there and everywhere as well to have their own bit of income coming in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have a farm, as you said, you don't know how the future is going to go like what would you advise children now like yeah. would you think that there's a viable future for them well, could the, you guarantee it to them hmm. you can't guarantee anything unfortunately in farming it never could and never will i think no matter what happens but looking at you say where are our children going at the moment i think no matter what your enterprise is even in farming where there's a good enterprise like say for example daring and there is a good income we are finding that less and less younger people want to come back into it because of the uh, hours that you have to put in. You take most teenagers now who are considering where are they going. They're looking to see, can I get a five day week? Can I get a job that's pensionable or I can pay into a pension fund to it? Is there flexibility? Will I have holidays? Now you take farming and you know you can have all of those but they're at a cost and the farm isn't always able to sustain the cost of providing that so i think what we're, we have to try and do going forward is that we're going to have to try and i don't like using the word educate because that sounds like somebody doesn't know is you know is ignorant of something but we're going to have to try and inform i think is the best word in farms of options that are out there and of young people of options that are there that things like as you said that buying into a pension that you can buy into a pension and different companies will will talk you through you know can you buy in even at a low rate and increase it as time goes by or whatever when it talks you know about that the lifestyle of farming we, we're constantly talking ourselves down that the lifestyle of farming is it's seven days a week, three, six, five. It is. But there is a lifestyle in it, and particularly from a family. You couldn't rear children in a better place than on a farm if you can financially 
support it. Uh, so I think we have to look at that. We also have to look at, you know, possibly that people will have to have some off-farm income or alternative enterprises on a farm. And young people are incredibly creative. And if we would encourage them to do that, rather than saying, you know, there's no income in farming, get away from it, we're going to educate you, get you out of farming. Because I know from my own three children, they would all say, we're all interested in the farm, we're not interested in the lack of income. You know, and that, or the, 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 the amount of income, because they can all get jobs that give them better income. But they all would love to farm. If it was viable, they would come home and farm. We hope one will, but they're, you know, it's, it's all to do with, with that. And I think, too, when you're talking about succession, you was just mentioned earlier, that topic of succession needs to be started at a very early stage because we have a problem in farming that the transfer of farm is not taking place until farmers are much older. And then you find that a person doesn't want to wait that long to get in there. So they leave it all together. They don't bother coming back. But if we could start that succession conversation early, and partnerships are a very, very viable way of doing, you know, of, of working two farms together. Because I would never advise an older farmer when they come, you know, to be looking about fair deal or something, and they'd say, you know, should we get rid of the farm? Should I hand over the farm? Well, my first question always is, do you have an income to keep you going before you give it to anyone else? You can't leave yourself penniless to hand it over. And yet, on my other half, I'm saying, please hand over your farm. It's terribly important that the younger generation get it. So I think partnerships are a great way for that because both can buy in. And sometimes the younger person buys in with the knowledge. The, younger person, the older person maybe with the day-to-day their skills. So I think we have to be creative going forward how we're going to move agriculture forward and how we're going to keep the family farm as a family farm. And going back to your question about you know inside the door how are we finding the pressures it is getting harder to fund third level education um, it's getting harder even second level to have that money freely available and transport is a huge thing in rural areas you know in the town you hop on a bus you walk down the road to the school we have to get buses and you know in the, at the moment listening even on the radio the problem with school buses and that's when it's supposed to be free can you imagine what it's like when you're paying a huge fee to get your bus as well so there are just some of the many things but there are advantages and I wouldn't like people to think farming is negative 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 we have our difficulties but we need to be creative of how we're going to deal with those difficulties going forward absolutely Michael she mentioned succession there and it's Mm. something we touch on it can be a sensitive subject for some people it can be something that they don't think about at all and leave it too late is there an optimal way of having an efficient or smooth you know transition in terms of succession well, I suppose every farm family is different, and, but the important thing is that they start the conversation, as you were saying, early, like, what is the plan? Even before a, a, a son or daughter is starting to college, what are they going to do in college? Are they going to take over the farm? Is it going to be split between two or three children? Or what is the... Like, there's no ideal situation. Everybody is totally different, but the, the key thing is to put a succession plan in place. Like, I've done some research with farmers who who have no identified successor. And there's huge mental stress there. There's who will I pass over the farm to? They want the farm to stay in the family name, but sons or daughters could be gone to America or Australia or wherever. Or they even have just got a better job off farm and they're not enticed to come back. But so it's a kind of a double-edged sword that farmers are continuing into retirement, but sometimes it's because of necessity, because of incomes, or there is a culture in Ireland that if you give up farming, you're not really a farmer anymore. So that culture probably needs to change. But as Alice said, farm partnerships is an ideal way to, to start the transition, even maybe enter into a five-year partnership or a 10-year partnership to see how everything is going. And then if they're happy at the end of that, perhaps they could transfer the farm fully mm-hmm. if that works for both parties. Apprenticeship scheme coming on board now next year, where you know we will have young farmers trained up to to a level eight in farm management, and some of those will not be farmers. They will not have a farm of their own to go back to, and yet you'll have on the other side, as Michael mentioned, farmers who have no successor or nobody who wants to take over the farm, and I think that's where there's plenty of room for partnering there too. The the, the new farm manager will come in with the the skill, the knowledge set, and the other man come or the other man or woman comes in with the asset set. So there's we have to be creative in this and think of you know can we can we work this as a new way going forward absolutely i've certainly noticed in in my own life the difference even in a 10-year period of someone saying oh you know my parents have the farm i work on the farm there too 
you know, one in every three certainly now saying, I farm in partnership with dad. Mm -hmm. I farm in partnership with mum and dad now, which has become a lot more common than it was mm -hmm. once upon a time. Alice, I don't know if that's your experience. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. We're hearing more of that, and particularly young, young females, which uh, is increasing. Uh, young females going into farming in partnership, not prepared to go in on their own, which I can understand because, not necessarily the physicality, because it's not as physical as it was, but it, I suppose security too. They are farming with their father or their, their mother or parents or whatever and we, we were noticing it quite pretty endearing mm -hmm. we're noticing a lot of that that the young female farmer is going into that young lads are as well but the young female farmer is definitely going in into that area because they see it as a as a way forward mm -hmm. and they have an income but they also have an interest in the farm and it's much easier work for something when it's for you than for a salary you know or not one, one working for the farm not knowing when is it going to be mine i could be old and gray and i think there is a culture to particularly among rural people not just farmers but rural people that when you sign when you make a will or you talk about succession you're signing your death notice mm -hmm. you know they, they, there is that and we have to get rid of that yeah. that we have to think think that it's more positive thing and it's for our good and, and all the tax implications there are around all of that and we have to be thinking in advance and we have to start getting people to start mm -hmm. having this discussion and then moving forward. Michael, is it more common now that women are getting involved? Is it more difficult for women to get involved in farm enterprises like that? No, I think the culture is slowly changing, but it has still an awful long way to go, but probably dairy, but that's because it is the most financially rewarding career. And with dairying, you have milking in the morning and the evening, but if you're in partnership with your parents, maybe you can take the weekend off or something. Mm -hmm. So. That seems to be the most attractive place, but then on the beef and the tillage side, the beef is the least profitable. It's just not enticing for people to maybe get involved because the profit margins are just so tight. So that's one of the huge challenges, but it, it's all back to the culture and the identity of farming, and that's what really needs to change, but that takes a long time to change. It does, and just one, one other thing I want to touch on uh, before we finish it, uh, today, Michael, is what is now being asked of farmers as well so we've talked a little bit about sustaining and making sure that there's a viable income going forward but at the same time there's a lot of change happening in agriculture mm -hmm. a lot more is being asked of farmers in terms of environmental standards uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing mm -hmm. some might say it is others might say it's wonderful but at the end of the day speaking purely from a financial and economic point of view some of the things and the measures that farmers will have to take, particularly over the next seven years, are going to come at a cost to a farm business. Yes. So how can this cost be mitigated or how can they be supported to keep the farm business viable, but also meet the criteria that they will now have to? Well, we all know that the emissions targets has to reduce by 25% by 2030, and that in itself is going to cause a huge challenge for farmers. But Nobody has really given guidance to farmers yet on what that will entail, what farm practices need to change, and at the end of the day, what, what's the impact on their farm incomes? And that's the big question. So I've written so, a little bit about balancing economic sustainability with environmental sustainability because everything has a cost and how those costs, nobody really has put a, a figure on those costs yet. And any sustainability initiative will have a cost and a benefit and they have to be really costed really. Alice that's true he makes a very good point there about the economic sustainability not versus the environmental sustainability but perhaps I think I've heard a lot of farmers feel there's a narrative out there that it has to be environmental sustainability at all costs. Hmm. That's, that, that, that's the conversation. But, you know, there's this kind of three prongs. There's the economic, there's the social and the environmental. And we really should be getting a balance between the three of those. And unfortunately, the narrative is all around the environmental. And, uh, you know, you're dead right. People are being told that we have to reach this environmental target, 25%. Nobody has done any research into the cost of getting there. It's, 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 it's literally at all cost. And that all cost means huge detrimental effect on both the financial and the social, the economic and social side of, of rural Ireland, let alone just farming, rural Ireland generally. You will drain it of, econo of, of, of its economic viability and therefore you will have social, uh, so an exit. So you will have a huge social uh, dep uh, deprivation in rural areas as the result of it because people won't stay. And I think, th I think the planning in the whole area of getting towards this 25% 
is very, very badly uh, handled. It has been very badly thought. It hasn't been thought out at all. I think I think it's a knee jerk reaction to a global uh, problem. And I think we, we're as a small little island. And I don't mean in any way to take away from the environment. It is very important, but it's one of the three legs on the stool. But I think what we ha- we are forgetting is we are prioritising. A, a, a global problem for a local thing and we're saying we're a little island in the middle of the ocean on the edge of Europe we can do our best and we but we can only have a certain effect on that whole global change but we are on the other side a huge producer of high quality food at a quite a good price really in, in world in world prices we produce very good quality food at a very good price we're going to destroy that and we're not going to end up making any impact on the climate because, unfortunately, the, a lot of this, the what we're being shown as possible things that we're going to have to do to reach the the the, the 25 percent are not viable. They're not doable. They're not actually practical for most farmers to do. And it's hard to say that, but that's the reality of it. Scientific knowledge brought us to where we are back from the 50s when when Forest Thulun just started. It brought us right up to where we are. And we did what we were asked according to CAP, produce cheap food, good quality, cheap food. We did it under scientific guidance. But the problem with the next section is there is no scientific guidance given to us or whatever is given to us is very small. And farmers by their nature will take on board that science if given it and given the time to do it. But expecting miracles, and that's what you would want to get anywhere near the 25%. But in the miracle of getting the 25%, unfortunately, you're going to be left with a lot of beggars because we're not going to be able to farm productively. And I think that's the problem. Very interesting points there. Thank you very much for joining us on this live discussion. Uh, We have to leave it there, afraid, for today. Alice Doyle, the Farm Family Chair with the IFA, and Dr. Michael Hayden from Maynooth University School of Business. Thank you very much for joining us today.